In episode 46, we discussed wireless communication and how one of the drawbacks of this new technology, developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was that there was no easy way to control who received the transmissions. So, within a short time, wireless encryption was developed, and code breaking became a fundamental element of warfare in the 20th century. It would impact World War II tremendously in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. In the Atlantic, the breaking of German codes allowed the U.S. to better protect its convoys, the logistical lifeblood of the conflict in Europe. In the Pacific, where the Navy was at the forefront of the conflict, code breaking was a critical element in several key battles. To talk about our object today, code breaking, and its impact in World War II and beyond, we are first joined by Thomas Cutler of the Naval Institute, and then by Dr. Scott Harmon, retired director of the Naval Academy Museum. Codes and code breaking are another aspect of naval warfare that have always played a, uh, an important role. Even going back to the days of sail, signals were often encrypted in case other ships were nearby. Uh, the enemy couldn't read your signals. Uh, they were also used to verify who was, uh, who was an enemy and who was a, a, a friend. Um, but, of course, the most dramatic examples of World War II, I think, when the, uh, the, the codes are broken there, both with the Germans and the Japanese, and of course, um, Midway is the big, big battle there, where the the code. Everybody knows that the code breaking was one of the major factors that alerted the the Americans that the Japanese were coming. What's less known is the fact that the Battle of Carl Sea was also uh, a lot of that was predicted through code breaking, and uh, later on uh, we were able to actually uh, take Yamamoto out of the equation because we were able to break codes and know where he was going to be at a certain time and. Uh, and he was actually, uh, his aircraft was shot down and, and took him out of, the, out of the battle equation for the rest of the war for obvious reasons. Um, codes, we, we learned a lot of lessons from, from uh, those things. We, we were determined not to make the same mistakes as our enemies and came up with very elaborate code, uh, cryptology systems after the war um, using electronics and various other means and mechanical rotors, all, all kinds of different devices were, were developed. Um, but with that came, you, you still had to have codes to plug into these various machines and so forth, and that came up with the development of the, um, uh, the what was in my day, in early days, was the registered publication system. It sounds rather inno innocuous, but it's, that's talking about the secret codes. Later became the CMS system, which is Communications Materials Security or something. I'm not even sure exactly what that is, but at any rate, those were the the idea of protecting, very carefully protecting all those codes and, and uh, we'll be the poor RPS or CMS custodian who misplaced something or whatever because it was very, very serious things. Even with that though, even with all those protections and so forth, in modern times the Navy suffered a huge setback when they had a, a defector, a, a spy, the Walter, excuse me, the Walker uh, family was uh, giving these codes, uh, access to these codes to the, uh, to the Soviets. They couldn't give them to them in time, in, in time enough for them to use these in, in a tactical situation, but it did allow the Soviets to go back and break the codes of previous messages and learn a great deal about what had happened previously. And that was a serious setback for us. So uh, nothing's foolproof. At this time, we're going to look at one of the major campaigns in World War II, the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, the battle against the German U-boats. And representative of that is an Enigma machine, which was the German coding uh, tool to send messages back and forth. Uh, going into the war, uh, the German U-boat uh, uh, commander the, uh, who led the U-boat effort uh, figured he knew how to defeat the technological advances the British had made uh, between World War I and World War II. And the tactic was to create wolf packs, uh, groups of submarines that would be in the route that the uh, convoys were taking from Canada and the United States to England, carrying the goods necessary for England to sustain the war. Uh, information would be gleaned through spies or an intelligence uh, sent to the German naval headquarters. That message would be encoded on one of these Enigma machines 
sent out to the submarines in the Atlantic, they would get it and be able to position themselves uh, along the route of the, the convoys. Uh, what the Germans did not realize was the British and the Americans were very active in trying to decipher these messages and were able to do so with some uh, convenience uh, to be able to uh, reroute the uh, convoys. So it was like a big chess game in the middle of the ocean, a deadly chess game. Uh, the Germans would try and put the U-boats in front of the convoys. The convoys would try and reroute themselves. Uh, one of the complications came about in midway in the war when uh, the Germans uh, updated their Enigma machine by adding another rotor, the cogged devices you can see on top of the mach uh, machine. They put a fourth rotor in that made uh, deciphering the codes much more difficult. Then a change came about uh, midway in the war also when the American industrial might was able to start building ships uh, in excess of the needs of the battles uh, and were able to build small uh, carriers, uh, what we call the uh, uh, escort carrier represented by this small model and a group of destroyers that would go out with this. These were called hunter-killer groups and their mission was to use the information gleaned from the Enigma deciphering and position a hunter-killer group out in the vicinity of a German U-boat to try and capture it or sink it. Uh, they did capture one, the U-505, which is now in the uh, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, we have some artifacts from the U-505. But this was a turning point, being able to have the uh, hunter-killer groups actively pursuing German U-boats. And by the end of the war, being a crew member on a German U-boat was the most dangerous activity in the war. Something like 75 to 80 percent of the German sailors and U-boats died during the war. So this is a, an important aspect of the war, what the United States Navy was doing, uh, its industrial base contributing to the outcome of the war. Thank you for joining us.